Hi, I'm Krista Byers Heinlein, and I'm here virtually with Angeline Sui. Together we'll be presenting on behalf of the Many Babies One Bilingual Team. Our project is part of Many Babies, a worldwide collaboration for replication and best practices in developmental psychology. Our project is a spin off project from Many Babies One, or MB1 which was actually published a few months ago in the journal AMPS. Many Babies One focuses on infant-directed speech. Infant-directed speech is the characteristic sing-song speech register that people and cultures around the world use when interacting with infants. In Many Babies One, infants' interest in infant-directed speech, or IDS, was compared to their interest in adult-directed speech, or ADS. Participants were monolingual infants learning different native languages. Many Babies One replicated the main finding that, yes, infants do prefer listening to infant-directed speech. The study also found that this preference increases with age and was actually strongest for infants learning North American English, which was the language of the stimuli in the study. Our interest in MB1B, Many Babies One Bilingual, was what about bilingual babies? Well, why would we be interested in studying bilinguals? Well, first, there's been no previous research on bilingual infants' preference for infant-directed speech. So we don't know whether bilinguals show the same preference for IDS as monolinguals and whether the developmental trajectory also looks similar. There is a lot of previous research, though, showing that monolinguals and bilinguals differ in different aspects of speech and information processing. So it raises the possibility that IDS preference could differ as well. Bilinguals also give us a unique way of looking at the effects of language experience. A monolingual infant is either learning North American English or they're not. So their exposure is binary. But for bilinguals, they could be hearing North American English not at all, 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%. This could actually vary continuously. So bilingual infants give us a way to look at exposure in a more nuanced fashion. Another reason that we wanted to do this study was because of some of the replicability issues we see in infant bilingualism research. And many of these issues are ones that are shared in infant experimental research in general. So first, most of the studies, at least historically in our field, have had quite small sample sizes. So 16, 20, 24 infants wouldn't be unusual at all. And we know that statistically, um, these findings are less likely to be robust and less likely to replicate in small samples like these. Because of the difficulty in recruiting and testing bilingual infants, few of our key findings have actually even been replicated once. Finally, each study typically tests one particular population of bilingual infants. So we actually don't know how much our findings generalize to other populations of bilinguals learning other language pairs. So by pooling our resources in this large scale study, we could begin to tackle some of these issues. So our target population varied um, both by their language background and by their age. So we had two language groups, bilingual infants who were exposed to two languages regularly from birth between 25% and 75% of the time. And one of those languages was the community language being learned by monolinguals growing up in our community. Labs also tested a comparison group of monolingual infants who had exposure to only one language, so that community language, at least 90% of the time. The two age groups we tested were six to nine month olds and 12 to 15 month, month olds. And these were two of the four age groups that were tested in the many babies, one monolingual study. Um, the reason we only tested two was just a more limited ability to recruit sufficient infants. Um, so we focused on these two age groups. In terms of the basic study setup, this was a looking time study, um, but labs varied in the particular setup that they used based on the equipment that they had available. 
So the variations included head turn preference, eye tracking, and central fixation. But in each case, infants saw a neutral visual stimulus and heard IDS and ADS speech on different trials, and their looking time was measured. There are 16 trials across the study. Prior to data collection, our study and analysis plan was pre-registered on the Open Science Framework and was submitted as a registered report to the journal AMPS. It was accepted as stage one and subsequently has been resubmitted with our results as a stage two registered report. And currently we're working on those revisions. Uh, and I'd just like to bring your attention to this list of amazing co-authors that we have on this project, 38 different collaborators, um, which is really a remarkable effort in this small field. So now I'll turn things over to Angeline, who will speak a little bit more about the participants as well as the analyses and results. Thank you, Krista. I'm Angeline. This is my pleasure to walk you through the analysis of the Manivis 1B. In our project, we compare our results with the Manivis 1. This is why we have created two types of samples for analysis. The first one is the full sample, where we will analyze all data for many babies one as well as many babies one B. In the next slide, you will see that not all the participating labs in many babies one contribute bilingual sample. This is why we also have another sample called match sample, where we will analyze data only from labs that contribute both monolingual and bilingual. This allows us to control for confounding factors such as community language as well as lab setup. Here is the sample size. As you can see here, for the match sample, there isn't a lot of differences between monolingual and bilingual in terms of the sample size. The difference is more substantial for the full sample. Having said that, our analysis have shown that the inferential statistic is somewhat similar across the full sample as well as the match sample. As mentioned, both the match sample as well as full sample yield very similar results. So for simplicity, in the following, we will present the findings of the match sample. In the analysis of this project, we have two approach. The meta-analysis approach as well as the mixed effect model approach. For the meta-analysis approach, we have more str uh, stricter uh, data exclusions criteria, where we only include labs that has 10 infants per language group. And this criteria is important because we need sufficient number of infants per language group in order to calculate effect size. For the mixed effect model approach, it is much more flexible. We can actually analyze all data from infants. Let us move on to talk about the research questions in this project. There are three research questions in this project. The first one, we want to ask whether bilingualism affects infant's ideas preference. As bilingual input is more challenging and variable, we want to test whether that may enhance ideas preference. While the first questions ask whether bilingualism may affect the magnitude of ideas preference, our second questions ask whether bilinguals are more variable in the preferences as well. In our third questions, we ask whether the amount of exposures to N North America and AE affect infant's ideas preference. In many babies one, the answer is yes. However, the result is a binary answer in the sense that it was only comparing infants who were exposed to NAE and infants who were not exposed to NAE at all. We still do not know whether there is a continuous positive relations between the amount of NAE and infant's ideas. And we will be able to test these questions in the Many Babies 1B. Let us talk about the results in research question number one. This is a forest plot for the meta-analysis data. Each point represents an effect size of different language group. The blue one represents the bilinguals, the red one represents the monolingual. The black cross represents the difference in effect size between the two language groups. As you can see here, sometimes this black cross would be positive, sometimes it can be near zero, 
and sometimes can be negative. So this is why in the meta-analysis, we actually did not find any evidence suggesting that there is monolingual and bilingual difference in terms of their ideas preferences. We also confirmed this result using mixed effect model. Here is a plot for the mixed effect model. Each point represents an infant. Again, the blue one represents the bilingual, the red one represents the monolingual. The y-axis represents the ideas preference, and x-axis represents the age. The lie represents the average of infant's ideas preference at different age groups. And we can see that there's not much difference between the monolingual and bilingual group. And both groups increase the ideas preference when they grow older. Now, I would like to move on to talk about the second research questions. Um, this question asks whether the bilinguals will have more variability in terms of ideas preferences in comparison to the monolingual. I would like to draw your attention to the forest plot again, where each, the error bar along each effect size represents a 95% confidence interval of the effect size in each language group. As you can see here, the 95% confidence interval are somewhat similar across different language groups. That's why in the meta-analysis, we did not find any evidence suggesting that bilingual's idea of preference is more variable. We also confirmed this analysis using the mixed effect model as well. Lastly, I would like to move on to talk about the relation between infant and AE exposures as well as IDS preference. In this analysis, we only focus on the bilingual infant. Each pawn represents an infant's data. Again, the y-axis is the IDS preference, and the x-axis will be the NAE exposures in terms of percentage of time that the baby is exposed to NAE. There are two models in this analysis. The first model, we analyze all the data from the bilingual group and found a positive relationship, which is illustrated by the blue line here. However, we also noticed that in the first model, there were a lot of babies who were not exposed to NAE at all. So in the second model, we only focus on infants who were exposed to a certain degree of NAE. And we also find a significant positive relation between NAE exposures and ideas preference. To sum up, our findings have suggested that bilingualism did not change ideas preference. This also suggests that ideas preference is somewhat universal as infants with different language background all show ideas preferences. On the other hand, our project also showed a unique contribution of the bilingualism research. It allows us to reveal a dose response relations between language input and outcome. Our findings about the positive relations between NAE and infant IDS is a good example. Although the monolingual study in many babies one also find that NA, infants with NAE exposure has stronger ideas preference than those who do not, it simply provides an answer for yes or no. From a theoretical point of view, it is important for researchers to craft out the relations between language input and outcomes in a more detailed way. And studying bilingualism offers us new insights for that because we can measure language input in a more continuous way. Finally, our project demonstrates the potentials of large-scale study in infancy research. Running bilingual studies is very time-consuming and challenging. As Krista has mentioned, we often suffer the small sample problem. By conducting large-scale study, we can solve this small sample problem and can more reliably assess bilingualism effect on in children's language outcome and increase generalizability of our results. Finally, I would like to acknowledge um, the Many Babies 1B and Many Babies 1 analyst team, as well as all the participating lab and families. We also welcome questions. Please feel free to send Krista and I an email or contact us through Twitter. Here is also a preprint link for our manuscript. Thank you.